evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the, the remarkable and brilliant Eva Bitova, uh, who will be returning to the stage a little later on, she said, I don't have to explain anything about her because everything that could be said about her, she says in her music. And um, that is the first time I've heard her live and I'm very, very thrilled about her being here. Uh, my name is Tom Stoppard. Um, as you know, there are many Belarusians in America in the sense that there are many, many Americans with Belarusian roots. And among them are a number of very distinguished Americans. Um, one of them has uh, sent a message for me to read to you this evening, and I'd like to begin by doing exactly that. I'm an American because my father's family came here from Belarus for a new life in the land of liberty. We have to use that liberty to support people who are denied such rights as a free and fair vote. As an actor, I am glad to support the Belarus Free Theater, which is a flagship of peaceful protest to bring justice and democracy to the country of my forebears. Michael Douglas. Thank you, Michael Douglas. Um, I myself this evening have very light, uh, unburdensome, pleasant uh, duties. Uh, one of them, a little later on, will be to impersonate a stage direction in a tiny play, which I will be very happy to do. But more immediately, um, I want to introduce somebody um, who, who many of you will uh, have already met or read about, known about, and she is Natalia Kaliaga, who is the artistic director of the Belarus Free Theatre. And, um, I've had the privilege of knowing Natalia and the group that's formed around her and uh, Kolya Kalezin. I've had the privilege of knowing them for about five years. I uh, think I would not like to embarrass them at this moment by trying to express the admiration I feel for that group of people, my admiration for their courage and persistence, not to mention their extraordinary gif gifts. Um, Natalia is going to come to the microphone and she was to have told you about what happened a month ago. I think she's got some news about what happened back in Belarus this very day. You know, we did want this evening to, in some sense, be an uplifting evening. I think that a wiser man than I have said, has said that, that the necessary response to adversity, to bad news in general, is to find something to, to cheer about. And in a way, paradoxically, the rather sort of painful experience of watching this group of people survive for five years and actually triumph for five years has been extremely cheering for everybody who's witnessed it. So I'm very proud indeed to invite to the microphone Natasha Kaliada. to the States, uh, we, we got 
so much of support. It's really amazing. And uh, one of the ideas, and uh, as always, uh, the greatest support is coming from London, from our greatest friend uh, and the, our family member, Tom Stoppard. And uh, with the absolutely amazing support of uh, American Pen Center, this event is taking place today. And when we spoke to Larry and Jakob and everyone in the Pen Center, it was absolutely obvious that it would be just uh, the most joyful event uh, when we would try to send a lot of uh, great and positive thoughts to people in Belarus. And I really, I promise you that I didn't plan to tell you some bad news. This is like, it looks like uh, this is my destiny for the last uh, month just to tell about bad news. But uh, today when it was the most uh, joyful uh, event in all our lives, and I believe in lives of people in Belarus, uh, today in New York there was a big protest. Uh, there were about 400 people uh, gathered at the UN, uh, Belarusian mission to UN. And it was organized uh, with public seat and Amnesty International, absolutely amazing event. And you cannot believe they were artists, theater people, because we do theater. We don't know what to do else, we just do theater. And there were up to 400 people, all of them from theater community. And at that moment, I thought that the event at Penn Center would be just continuation of this amazing joy and uh, such amazing uh, support that we get here. But at the moment when the protest, peaceful protest, was ending up in New York, we got news from uh, husband of our actress, Jana Rusakevich, who will be performing tonight. And uh, we got only one word. It was just text message, and it was written there, arrest. After that, we tried to call him, but the phone was down. So today, there was a protest in Minsk as well, because today is one month anniversary after crackdown in Belarus, after the presidential elections when up to 700, from 700 to 1,000 people got arrested and terribly beaten up. And uh, for today, 30 of them are staying in KGB jails. So today, 22 people got to jail again. So for today, about up to 60 people are staying in jail in Minsk. So uh, the only thing that I could ask you to do and uh, to do what you do now, because everything is done by artists in the States, in New York, and everything is done by London people, by London, uh, by British actors. It gave so much support before the elections. And now it gives so much support after the elections. And uh, we truly believe that the world leaders need to answer to artists, why artists insist on immediate release of political prisoners, why artists go and organize protests in New York, but politicians do not still have steps. They have just words. So the only thing that I wish that everything that is happening here in New York and all that great support that is coming from artists will be done at the same level, on political level. And then the situation in Belarus will be changed. Thank you so much for this amazing support. We need it, and we need it especially now, and especially today when one of our actress, knowing that her husband is in jail, will be performing because she believes that art could save our country. So uh, once again, thank you so much, and I would like to uh, introduce uh, Michael Lawrence, absolutely amazing New York uh, actor, and. Uh, my husband and co-founder of uh, Belarus Free Theater, Nikolai Halizin. They would read two poems of Vladimir Nikolaev. He's the best uh, poet in Belarus. And he was a presidential, uh, presidential candidate. Now he's in KGB and he could face up to 15 years. He was terribly beaten up. We don't have any news from him, but his poems are alive. So here they're coming.
страх в краях сбитых войнами. Так что страх не излечить. На вот воля невольная. Вольно души лечить. Там не мау ей верников, а холопы одны. Прагнуть пуги и перника, а на воле яны. Fear. In countries degraded by wars, so that fear is everywhere, even the will is not free to freely unite souls there. Devotees are nowhere to be found, only slaves left along, craving carrot and stick, not freedom at all. Да Бога, дрогкая дорога, сдороженный, собой самим знеможенный, шукал я Бога во всем, бы он и был во всем. Я во успокусах прагло тело, и дух был с целым заодно, а небо яминой темнело, и проступало у небе дно. Над ямой небо ставши с краю, и убачивши себе на дне, спытался я, Кого шукаю? И выдохнул одно. Мене. A bumpy road leads to God. Emaciated, myself exhausted. I was looking for the Lord in anything, for he was in everything. His body felt temptations craving there, and the soul united with the body. But sky was as a pit, darkened there, and the bottom showed itself already. By the sky's edge I stood and saw myself on the bottom. I asked, who am I looking for? And the bottom breathed out, me. Thank you. Again, that the translation was done by, by one of our greatest friends, uh, Catherine Corey. She is professor at Tisch School, New York University. And I would like to invite to the stage uh, one of the most uh, distinguished novelists of the 20th century, uh, E. L. Doktorov. spins on its axis. Its planetary um, sloppage of water rises and tidal swells continuously around its periphery, bulging like the cornea of a far-sighted eye. At the same time, the Earth's rotation sends the sea water spinning in opposite directions, westward in the northern hemisphere, eastward in the southern, so that if water could plant the earth would twist into a long blue-green braid. If for some reason the planetary rotation decreased sufficiently, the waters of the earth would fly off and crystallize into an ice blue ring that would eventually attenuate and head into space. An enormous comet with all its plankton, crabs, fish, bivalves, waves, whales, siphonophores, and shipwrecks flash frozen for eternity. The planet's remaining core of rock and mineral and molten magma would glow for a moment like an ember, or like the section of a radiant creature's toothy jawbone, before it crashed into the moon, creating a big burning smoking mass of disintegrated ores that would be neatly sucked up into the sun like krill into the mouth of a gulper eel. So we thankful to God that the system of cosmic checks and balances, as eccentric as it is, seems to be working. And just as there are the Alps and the Himalayas and the Andes and the Rockies, so there are undersea mountain ranges even more vast. And just as we have our sunlit river running canyons, so does the sea bottom have its deep trenches. And as we have our flat lands and deserts, so does the seabed stretch for endless miles of abyssal plain. 
And just as we have our mountain goats standing transfixedly faced into the wind on the unequal crags of our highest mountains, so does the lightless, airless ocean bottom with its tons of pressure per square inch have its living tube worms and anglerfish, sea spiders, whip noses, and sea lilies undulating, slimed in the soundless blackness, their mouths agape and tentacles upheld to catch the flocculent dead matter drifting like snow from the blue and green ocean above. Nameless creature composed of tendrils with suckers on the end, stems with mouths or jet-propelled worms with toxic stingers and ink ejection mechanisms receive as God's bounty a perpetual fall of death that keeps them alive as they squirt and wriggle about their business. This is all part of the universal plan. We are instructed that life does not require air or light or warmth. We are instructed that whatever condition God provides, some sort of creature will invent itself to live in it. There is no fixed morphology for living things, no necessary condition for life. Thousands of unknown plant and animal beings are living in the deepest canyons of the black cold water. Their biomass is far in excess of our own sunlit and air breathing plant and animal life. At the very bottom of the sea are smoking vents of hydrogen sulfide gases in which bacteria are pleased to flourish. And feeding upon these are warty bivalves and viscous gummy jellies and spiny eels with the amazing ability to fluoresce when they are attacked or need to illuminate their prey. God has a reason for all this. There is one fish, the hatchet, which skulks about in the deep darkness with protuberant eyes on the top of its horned head, and the ability to electrically light its anus to blind predators sneaking up behind it. The electric anus, however, is not an innate feature. It comes from a colony of luminescent bacteria that house themselves symbiotically in the fish's asshole. <laughs> and there is a purpose in this as well, which we haven't yet ascertained. But if you believe God's divine judgment and you countenance reincarnation, then it may be reasonably assumed that certain bacteria living in the anus of a particularly ancient hatchet fish at the bottom of the ocean are the recycled and fully sentient souls of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, <laughs> Pol Pot, glimmering miserably through the cloacal muck in which they are periodically bathed and nourished. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but that's not a word we use here. Oh, of course not. I, I, I was it has only... no place in what we do here. That's what I've... What... That word has no bearing. Good. In fact, the term we use here is pizza. What? It's what? Pizza. Pizza as in... That's what the men call it. That's what they call what? what we do here. Oh. Why? Well, it's an acronym, obviously. P-I-Z-Z-A. No, you're right. It's more of an ellipsis. Uh, <laughs> persuasion and interrogation techniques. Approved. We go strictly by the book here. Well, it's more of a sheet of paper, really. Uh, the pizza list. Every man under my command can recite it in his sleep, and woman, and dog, I shouldn't wonder. I'm a stickler for it. The pizza list. 
uh, Napolitana, Margarita, Quattro Formage, you name it, and a whole vocabulary of options, con this, con that. Um, you said dog? The Parmigiana con Bow Wow. <laughs> the irrepressible humor of our serving soldier. Don't worry, biting is absolutely off the menu. Scaring the piss out of a suspect is pizza, however. Dogs, rats, snakes, spiders, the Parmigiana is about exploiting phobias, basically. Anyway, what can I do for you? Uh, it's about Crown versus Eggleston. Fine, fire away. Excuse me. I'm the sound of a door. I'm also the sound which comes through the open door. I am the sound of screaming, shouting, crying, dogs barking, rock music. I'm a soldier who walks up to this man with a piece of paper on a clipboard, which I offer him. No go. He signs. Anchovies. I take the clipboard away, and I leave, and the door closes. Nothing without a signature, you see. So, Crown versus Egglestone, what's the problem? The witness statement. Do you want it changed? Changed. We're waiting for it. We haven't received it. That's bad. Changed? What witness statement? I, I, I don't know. How many witnesses do we have? How many would you like? That's not what I asked. Uh, two. Done. Witness <laughs> A and B. Well, what I mean is I, I can't. The, the Crown cannot. We, we cannot go into court with nothing but a confession that might be inadmissible. Why might it? No, for example, if it were made under... Under what? Not that word again, I hope. Duress. Duress. Was Mr. Eggleston under duress when he made his confession statement? I should think so. He was under arrest. His capture was a major morale booster in the war against the Northern Alliance and, of course, a tactical success for our boys in the heather. Putting Sam Egglestone away strikes at the very heart of enemy capability. He is a taxi driver. He's a commander in the Jacobite army. <laughs> he had his wife run a two-car taxi service in the village outside Kendall. That as may be, but he's confessed to commanding field operations from the border down to Kirby Lonsdale and east of Barnard Castle. Uh -huh. That takes in a lot of atrocities. By their army, you said. Yes. It's a war. Yes. The Geneva Convention applies. Yes. It applies to this prisoner, Eggleston. No. It doesn't? No. It applies to the Northern Alliance as a whole, which means we wage war by Geneva rules. No gas, no targeting civilians, a whole rigmarole of no, no, naughty. But it doesn't apply to jacko taxi drivers with no uniform or insignia committing criminal acts. Otherwise, what are you doing here? That's what I'm wondering. The Crown Prosecution Office entered unchartered waters here. So, where did the pizza list come from? From the top. From... And the top was consulting with... With me. I and my staff put our heads together, sent the list up the mountain, and it came back, signed off on. Look, I don't know where this is supposed to be leading. Under persuasion and interrogation techniques approved, we have shouting, we have deception, we have... You, you shouted at him? Dear, oh dear, you're not going to like where the rest of this is going. <laughs> and uh, what's deception? We lie, as in... Your mate's already shopped you, as in, we've got your missus next door, and that's you. That's her you can hear. From there, we go to stress positions, isolation, no sleep, no dark, loudspeakers, no light, sweat box, arctic conditions, arctic monkeys, German shepherds, mock execution, pissed pants, and everybody's favorite, the Americana con Pellegrino, which is not waving, but drowning. The whole pizzeria. Right. I'm afraid I'm going to have to recommend not proceeding with Crown versus Eggleston. The state of emergency by transferring investigation to the military 
has made a discontinuity between the accumulation of evidence and the administration of justice. Whether or not this prisoner is covered by Common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention, prohibiting cruel or inhumane statement, treatment, or, or a fiatory by Article 88 expressly forbidding torture, Just let me finish, please. Your pizza menu, sorry, list, is undoubtedly trumped by the UN Convention Against Torture. Just a moment, to which this country is a signatory, and by the European Convention on Human Rights. I don't know a judge who wouldn't take that view. Well, I know a couple. I mean, one could say that a country can't be held to a promise in a situation where keeping it would threaten its very existence. But actually, I'd love to know how you think you can get information from a prisoner who's withholding information. Rapport. Rapport. Building rapport. Building rapport. Can I go off road for a minute? Of course, Valerie, go ahead. John. I, I don't use my first name, I, I use my middle name. Sorry, that's the trouble with relying on files. Go ahead, Margot. Well, John, I, I, I just think using torture makes us as bad or worse than the enemy. We are all human, that's absolute. We are not just bodies, we are souls. Anyway, torture is unreliable because anyone will say anything to stop it. Also, the enemy aren't numbskulls. They'll change their plans where there's a possibility of a captive giving the plans away. But the worst thing about torture is that it exposes our own men to retaliation in kind if they are themselves captured. So torture is just bad in every way. It's stupid. I won't be needing the witness statement. Now, I did warn you about that word, didn't I? And you didn't listen. You used it you know, five or six times, just as if I hadn't told you. So what I want you to do now is withdraw that word. You what? I want you to say it's not torture, it's pizza. I certainly will not. What on earth? That's all you've got to do. It's not torture, it's pizza. I think this meeting is over. You're not leaving until you say it's not torture, it's pizza. Are you serious? Sit down. Are you threatening me? It's not torture. It's pizza. This is mad. Just say it and you can walk out of here. It'll be a normal day. Five little words and life goes on. What's for dinner, Mommy? What's on TV? Hello, Margo. Darling, I'm home. Jennifer, give Daddy a kiss. I'm just guessing here. Could be you're all dysfunctional, but same thing applies. It's not torture. It's pizza. Okay? Otherwise, I don't know how long it'll take to sort this out while you're standing up in pitch dark in paper pants and no stockings in case you're tempted to harm yourself after the first week. Uh, Don't breathe like uh, that. Concentrate on breathing slowly, evenly. Tell me what you're thinking. I don't believe you. I don't, I don't believe that you can. It's easy enough to find out. Uh, I'll give you 30 seconds and then you'll know. Or you can say, it's not torture. It's pizza, up to you. But, uh, Sorry, did you speak? I didn't say that it was torture. I, I said a court may take the view. Now you're wiggling. I hate that. And time's up. So fuck you. And Thursday's your husband's afternoon with his tart, so I'll have to send a Land Rover for the school pickup. Jenny can kick her heels in the kennels till uh, he gets here. Does she like doggies? It's not. It, Too late. It, Stand up. It's not torture. It's a pizza. Can't hear you. 
It's not torture, it's pizza. Now you're just saying it. No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, please. It's not torture, it's pizza. Rapport. <laughs> Honestly, did you, have you take leave of your senses? Do you think I'd lock up a crown prosecutor on a whim? We're just getting on my wick? Oh, I've upset you. Sorry. I'll bung you the witness statements ASAP. Ciao. In case you're not sure, I made up that about your husband's tart. Never laid a finger on her. Enormous pleasure now to introduce a writer, a great writer, somebody that I'm thrilled to meet now. And he too will be reading an extract from I don't actually know what, but I look forward to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Don DeLillo. brief fragment from the novel Mao Tu, uh, a European photographer in Beirut in the 1980s. Brita is staying in East Beirut in a flat that belongs to a friend of a friend. The hotels are crushed or ransacked or occupied by squatters, and the flat has been empty for over a year. So here she is back out on the balcony again. It's late and she has eaten and taken a bath and read a magazine piece about Beirut because what else can you read or think or talk about in a place like this? She doesn't especially want to sleep. Not that sleep would be easy in any case. All night, intermittent bursts of machine gun fire and many dark rumbles to the immediate east that sound like mountains ringing and the odd round fired now and then some despond of the heart or a drug deal gone slightly sour. And she doesn't like being in bed when the shooters are about. Even in the periodic stillness, she finds herself scrutinizing the silence, waiting uneasily for the boxy clatter to begin again. So out she comes one more time, half-dressed, wanting to stand within it, feel the cordite wash of the city against her skin. She sees streaky lights bolting from the coast and making long bodiless arcs over the roofscape and down through scuds of dark smoke that roll across the low sky. A black van goes by right below and there's a curly haired guy sticking out of the sunroof wearing an iridescent tracksuit and shouldering a rocket propelled grenade launcher that's about seven feet long. He is the phallic master of the Levant, at least for now. A radio plays voices calling in, several radios perched on balconies, people talking about Beirut because there's no other subject. She wants to stand inside it. It is wrapped all around her like some computerized wall of enhanced sensation. She goes inside and finds a bottle of Midori melon liqueur. She can hardly believe there is such a thing. She has seen it advertised at airports and convention centers to walk through places of the world. She pours some into a glass and takes it out to the balcony. Sirens going in the distance. On a wall across the street, layers of graffiti, deep deposits of names and dates and slogans. A silver flare sails briefly over the streets, bits of incandescence trailing away, radio voices calling all around her. Beirut, Beirut. They crowd in toward her, pressing with a mournful force. People calling from basement shelters, faces in shadow, clothing going dark with heavy sweat, sleeping children curled around their war toys. All the hostages pray for them stashed in their closets and toilets. All the babies pray for them lying in rag hammocks. All the refugees pray for their dead and wait for the shelling to subside. 
The war is so fucking simple. It is the lunar part of us that dreams of wasted terrain. She hears their voices calling across the leveled city. Her only language is Beirut. She drinks the scummy green liqueur and goes inside to get some sleep. She has to be up before seven and on her way out of here. About an hour later, something wakes her. She comes out on the balcony again, telling herself to be alert. It is nearly 4 a.m. and she has a sense of some heavy presence, a grinding in the earth. She leans over the rail and sees a tank come chugging around the corner into her cratered street, mounted cannon bobbing. She feels the beat of adrenaline but stays where she is and waits. She thinks it's an old Soviet T-34, some scarred and cruddy ancient, sold and stolen two dozen times, changing sides and systems and religions. The only markings are graffiti, many years of spritzed paint. The tank moves up the street and she hears voices, sees people walking behind it, civilians talking and laughing and well-dressed, 20 adults and half as many children, mostly girls in pretty dresses and white knee stockings and patent leather shoes. And here's the stunning thing that takes her a moment to understand, that this is a wedding party going by. The bride and groom carry champagne glasses, and some of the girls hold sparklers that send off showers of excited light. A guest in a pastel tuxedo smokes a long cigar and does a dance around a shell hole, delighting the kids. The bride's gown is beautiful, with lacy applique at the bodice, and she looks surpassingly alive. They all look transcendent, free of limits, and unsurprised to be here. They make it seem only natural, that a wedding might advance its resplendence with a freelance tank as escort. Sparklers going, other children holding roses, tissued in fern. Brita is gripping the rail. She wants to dance or laugh or jump off the balcony. It seems completely possible that she will land softly among them and walk along in her pajama shirt and panties all the way to heaven. The tank is passing right below her, turret covered in crude drawings, and she hurries inside and pours another glass of melon liqueur and comes out to toast the newlyweds, calling down bon chance and bon yeu and good luck and salam and skol. And the gun turret begins to rotate and the cannon eases slowly around like a smutty honeymoon joke and everyone is laughing. The bridegroom raises his glass to the half-dressed foreigner on the top floor balcony and then they pass into the night followed by a jeep with a recoilless rifle mounted at the rear. It is over too soon. She stays outside, listening to the last small rustle of their voices falling. It is still dark and she feels a chill in the smoky air. The city is quiet for the first time since she arrived. She examines the silence. She looks out past the rooftops, westward. There's a flash out there in the dark near a major checkpoint then another in the same spot, several more, intense and white. She waits for the reciprocating flash, the return fire, but all the bursts are in one spot and there is no sound. What can it be then if it's not the start of the day's first exchange of automatic weapons fire? Only one thing, of course. Someone is out there with a camera and a flash unit. Breather stays on the balcony for another minute, watching the magnesium pulse that brings an image to a strip of film. She crosses her arms over her body against a chill and counts off the bursts of relentless light. The dead city photographed one more time. Thank you.
ridden in twine, limbs in twine, buttocks in twine, skin in twine, trust in twine, fears in twine, adventures in twine. will now present a half an hour piece. This is the third part of Zone of Silence three hour performance. Don't, don't get scared, it will not take three hours. Just uh, half an hour, but uh, I, I wish you could see the whole performance. But uh, it's called Numbers, and uh, actors of Belarus Free Theatre thought about Belarus by their bodies. You will see just numbers uh, on Belarus, what's happening in Belarus, but just in numbers, if it makes any sense. The performance is called Zone of Silence, director of the performance, Vladimir Sherman, and after the piece, I would introduce all actors to you. Thank you so much.
Zeme vor dem großen Tor. Steht eine Laterne und steht sie noch davor. Da wollen wir uns wiedersehen bei der Laterne. Wollen wir stehen?
Он не чуя под собою Между небом и землею Как во сне с тобой танцую Аромат духов так манит Опьяняет и дурманит Ах, как сладко в нем тону я Так близки наши тела И безумные слова Без стыда тебе шепчу я Ах, какая женщина, какая
Московский край, мой Беларус. Я к тебе хожу на развитание, до спаткания, до сустрачи. Я к тебе хожу на развитание, до спаткания, до сустрачи. Совет Безопасности единодушно высказался за строительство АЭС. Это как выстрел из стартового пистолета, давший сигнал новому этапу развития ядерной энергетики в Беларуси. Такую спортивную лексику употребил заместитель председателя Президиума Национальной Академии Наук, доктор технических наук Владимир Тимошпольский, подчеркивая значимость принятого президентом указа номер 565 о некоторых мерах по строительству атомной электростанции. До этого президент не раз обращался к ядерной теме, в том числе выступая на первом съезде ученых страны. И вот, выбор сделан. Запущен механизм реализации глобального энергетического проекта. В Минэнерго сообщили, что сейчас идет подготовительный этап работ. Предполагается, что первый блок АЭС будет введен в 2016-2017 годах, второй в 2020. По прогнозам, стоимость строительства АЭС составит 3-4 миллиарда долларов из расчета на два энергоблока мощностью 1 миллион мегаватт каждый. 
поставщик энергоблоков определиться через тендер. Хотя ученые говорят о высокой вероятности его выигрыша российскими партнерами. Я на 99% уверен, что это будет все-таки Российская Федерация, откровенно заявил Владимир Тимошпольский. Подводя итоги, президент подчеркнул, что теперь, когда окончательное решение принято, необходимо максимально ускорить темпы подготовки к строительству.
Vladimir Sherbin is director of this performance. Uh, Denis Tarasenko. Pavel Gorodnitsky. Yana Rusakevich. Marina Yurievich. Alexey Dorchik. And just this young... I'm Nikolai Halizin and <laughs> Natalia Halizin. Her husband was arrested today, so forgive us for this. I'm Larry Seams. I direct the Freedom to Write and International Programs at Penn American Center. Thank you. A couple of words of thanks and a final word. Um, many, many thanks to Le Poisson Rouge and especially to Dustin Nelson. Thank you so much. Um, to Carol Llewellyn and to my Penn colleagues, Jakob Orsos, Elizabeth Weinstein, and Sarah Hoffman. To all of tonight's participants so being so, for being so generous with their time and their voices, Billy, Margaret, and Eva, Don DeLillo and E.L. Doctorow, who are always there when writers and creative freedom are threatened. <laughs> and especially Tom Stoppard, who is another one of those who is always there and who is absolutely the driving force between the, behind this evening. Belarus really is an old school dictatorship, and what has been happening there this past month is outrageous. And it hits very close to home for Penn. The office of Belarusian Penn in Minsk was raided a couple of weeks after last month's election, and its computers and papers were seized. Vladimir Nikolayev, who dared to run against Lukashenko and whose beautiful poems we heard tonight, is a former president of Belarusian Penn. He and two other Penn members, Pavel Severenitz and Alexander Fiaduta, have been held in old school KGB prisons and will stand trial next month on specious charges of organizing riots, charges that could land them 23 years in prison. Your presence here tonight is a gesture of solidarity with them and with all the writers, artists, journalists, and intellectuals now being targeted in, Be in, Be in Belarus. On their behalf, Thank you, and thank you for your support for Penn. We will not let up until they are free. I want to say, though, that the right of freedom of expression under international law is not just the right to speak and create freely in your own community. It also guarantees the right of all of us here in this room to hear and to read and to listen to what someone is saying or creating anywhere in the world. When a Belarusian poet is silenced, it violates our right to hear her. When the Belarusian theater, Belarusian free theater is silenced, it violates our right to see them. Standing up for freedom of expression in Belarus is not a selfless act on our part. So thank you to the Belarus free theater for your work, your courage, and your inspiration, and for making full our right to freedom of expression. And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight in this wonderful show of support. As you know, the proceeds from the tickets tonight are going to the Belarus Free Theater. We also have a table set up on the way out uh, with donation information. Please know that if you care to and can contribute more to support this amazing group, even just a few dollars, it will be most welcome and gratefully received. Now, 
We have the room for another 30 minutes. The, Bel the, the Belarus Free Theater will be here. Please stay, meet them, buy drinks, buy them drinks, and, en and enjoy yourselves. And thank you all very much for coming.